Welcome to uh, Chicago Bible Society's uh, Journey to the Cross, our uh, series of Bible studies during the season of Lent. Um, just a couple quick words about the Chicago Bible Society for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Um, we've been around for a long time. We were started in 1840, which is just a few years after the city itself was incorporated. And we've, been, and we've grown up with the city of Chicago, and we've been a part of the city of Chicago for all those years. Our primary ministry is working in the county jail systems with the chaplains. We provide Bibles, and we also run small group Bible studies. Uh, we've had uh, nearly a thousand inmates over the last five years go through our small group Bible study program, um, which is a 12-week program, and we've had a 90% graduation rate from it, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, we also work with the hospital systems, we work with some of the after school programs, providing uh, literacy materials that are Bible based. And finally, uh, part of our mission is to encourage people to read the Bible. And so that's part of what uh, we're doing here, is we're encouraging you during this time of Lent to read the Bible. So welcome. Um, also a reminder, this is the first of four. So the next four Fridays, we will be right here with a different speaker every Friday from a mixture of Protestant and Catholic backgrounds, uh, Bible scholars who will be teaching about the Bible during this time. Um, finally, after we are finished, um, we have a special gift for you. We, if you would like it, we don't want you to take it if you're not going to use it, but we have a free New Testament for you. It's a nice, small, uh, compact size that you can use yourself, or you can give away to somebody that you know needs uh, to read God's Word. Um, I would like now like to uh, invite uh, Pastor Wendy Witt to come up and just say a few words of welcome. You know that's dangerous. I always say I can't even say my name in a few sentences. But welcome. I am Reverend Wendy Witt. I'm on the pastoral team here at the Chicago Temple. We actually predate the city of Chicago. Not this building, but this congregation. We were the, the first congregation ever in what is now Chicago. So we welcome you to this historic congregation located in the heart of the Chicago Loop. My job here is to connect church and community, and we couldn't be in a more profound place for me to do that. Taking God's word out of the building and into the community to live the word and to shape the world around us according to the will of our God. So I welcome you, not only today, but for the next four weeks as together we journey towards the cross. And now I'm going to journey downstairs and try and get you all some more heat. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Bill Seitz with the uh, Chicago Bible Society, and I'm here to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Philip Reichen is the 8th president of Wheaton College. He's a Wheaton native. Uh, president Reichen is the son of Professor Reichen, who most of us know and remember. Um, and uh, Professor Reichen was the winner of the Chicago Bible Society's Gutenberg Award in 2003. Um, Dr. Reichen attended Wheaton College and graduated in 1988, so that predates some of us or makes us feel rather young or old, however that works. <laughs> um, he uh, graduated with a major in uh, English Literature and Philosophy. He met his wife Lisa at Wheaton. The Reichens have five children. Dr. Reichen earned a Master of Divinity from Westminster Theological Seminary and a Doctorate in Historical Theology from the University of Oxford. He returned from England to join the pastoral staff at 10th Press in Philadelphia in 95, preaching there until his appointment at Wheaton. Um, Dr. Reichen has published over 30 books, including The Message of Salvation, The Art of God's Sake, and Loving the Way Jesus Loves by three different publishers, which is a, a great feat in itself, instead of just one publisher. And he has done uh, many commentaries on Exodus, Jeremiah, Luke, and other books of the Bible. So, anyway. well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for coming. I have to say that being um, 
here in the city this morning brings back a lot of memories, both romantic and spiritual. Uh, we're very close to the Picasso statue, and uh, really the first long date that Lisa and I had was here in Chicago, and it was really out in the plaza out here. I said, this is the woman I want to marry. Uh, so then it was with the, with the snow falling, so I really brought that memory back this morning. And it's great to be in the city. This brings back so many memories of uh, ministry in Philadelphia. Um, and particularly given that it's a Lenten season, because uh, we had um, services somewhat like this in downtown Philadelphia during lunchtime in the Lenten season. So uh, thank you for being here this morning, and uh, we pray this will be a blessing, uh, not just this morning, but in the coming weeks. Uh, some years ago now, I was in the city of Edinburgh on the day when Queen Elizabeth was coming into the city to take up residence at Holyrood Palace. And we were taking a bus tour of the city, and the tour guide was pointing out this and pointing out that, and then all of a sudden she said, and there's the Queen. And uh, you can only imagine the way that everybody in the bus went to that side of the bus to try to catch even one glimpse of her royal person as she was driving in her car uh, into the palace to take up residence. Royalty was on parade. But oh, to have been in Jerusalem on the day when the king of all kings went on his royal parade and the crowds gathered to say, Hail to the king, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the way that Luke describes that event. I'm reading now from Luke chapter 19 in the Good News Translation. And uh, hopefully you have brought your Bible to this Bible Society gathering. Although I had to confess when I walked in that one of my children had poached my car Bible. And so I was only too happy to receive the gift of this Bible. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. After Jesus said this, he went on in front of them toward Jerusalem. As he came near Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As you go in, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks you why you are untying it, Tell him that the master needs it. They went on their way and found everything just as Jesus had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying it? The master needs it. They answered, and they took the colt to Jesus. Then they threw their cloaks over the animal and helped Jesus get on. As he rode on, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near Jerusalem, at the place where the road went down the Mount of Olives, the large crowd of his disciples began to thank God and praise him in loud voices for all the great things that they had seen. God bless the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, command your disciples to be quiet. Jesus answered, I tell you, that if they keep quiet, the stone, stones themselves will start shouting. This is God's word, which he has promised to bless to our minds and hearts. Well, ever since he had set his face toward Jerusalem at the end of chapter 9, who okay, had described this earlier in his book, Jesus had been moving in this direction. He was not in Jerusalem for his coronation, but for his crucifixion. He was going up to the city to die. And yet before that cross, here we are given a glimpse of the crown, as Luke shows us what kingly honor Jesus deserved. This royal entrance is a momentary triumph before an impending tragedy. For soon Jesus would suffer the humiliation of the crucifixion. But first, God wanted people to catch at least a glimpse of who he really was, and for a few minutes at least, to give him something like the majesty that he deserved. And in this story, which Christians often celebrate on what we call Palm Sunday, 
we see these three things that I want to share with us this morning. First, the king claiming his property. Second, the king displaying his humility. And third, the king receiving at least some of his glory. And I want to encourage us this morning to ask ourselves this question, am I ready to give the king the wealth and the honor that he deserves? Well, Luke begins his account of this triumphal approach, technically not actually yet his entry, but his approach to Jerusalem by relating a little incident that turns out to be essential to the unfolding drama. Jesus is a few miles outside of Jerusalem, and there was something he needed to get before he entered the city. Luke calls this animal a colt. Matthew specifies the colt of a donkey tied up with its mother. And uh, at first it almost seems like the disciples are going to be guilty of rustling livestock. Uh, when the owners of this animal saw what they were doing, they certainly had some questions that they wanted answered. What are you doing? That's what they asked. The answer they are given sounds almost like a password. The Lord has need of it. And so perhaps Jesus had arranged in advance to borrow a donkey, perhaps. Perhaps the owners recognized these men as followers of Jesus. At any rate, they seemed to know who this Lord was, and they were ready to serve him. In a way, it's somewhat remarkable that Jesus was asking for anything at all. If you know his story from the Gospels, you know he had virtually no possessions to call his own. Essentially, the clothes on his back. He had no home. And yet here he is saying that there is something that he has need of. And as he makes his final preparations to enter Jerusalem, as he orchestrates the events of this Palm Sunday, Jesus claims a need for a donkey's cult. I think it's uh, perhaps important to recognize that this donkey in one sense belonged to the Lord already simply by virtue of the fact that he is the creator God. The scripture says that all things were created through Christ and for Christ. This donkey belonged to Christ. It was his donkey and he was claiming it for his purposes. And somehow the people in charge of this donkey who had a stewardship responsibility for it recognized this. They did not claim the donkey as their own, but when their Lord requested it, they offered it in service to the king. This can be a reminder for us this morning that whatever we like in life to call our own, our time, our money, our abilities, whatever it is, that uh, these words from Luke chapter 19 help us evaluate our stewardship. As we think about our money, for example, and how we're going to spend it, a good question to ask is, does the Lord have need of this? Does he need it more for the purposes of his kingdom than I, than I need it for my own well-being? We recently had a discussion about this on Wheaton's campus. Various members of the uh, Bible and theology department, as they were making their move to their new quarters on the fifth floor of our Billy Graham Center, had decided that uh, they would take whatever books they perhaps didn't need or perhaps could better be used elsewhere and gather those books together and we would send them to a theological libraries overseas and as we were dedicating those books to God's service I said really the important question for us to ask about our books is not is there a chance I'll need this sometime in the future but uh, where will this book be more most useful? Is it more useful on my shelf or perhaps on the shelf of some pastor or theologian in the third world? A number of our uh, scholars told me later that when they heard that question, they wished they had another opportunity right then to go back to their library because probably there were some books that wouldn't, wouldn't really meet that standard by staying in Wheaton but really needed to go somewhere else. But what a wonderful question uh, to ask, does the Lord have need of this? And as we consider the needs of a world that is lost without the gospel, the answer will almost always be yes. But really the question for us is whether we are willing to let the king stake his claim to what we own, which is really his royal property to begin with. 
And so here is the first thing from Luke 19, the king claiming his property. Now, the reason Jesus needed this particular donkey was to display his humility in fulfilling one of the ancient prophecies about his kingship. By riding into Jerusalem on this borrowed beast of burden, Jesus was making a public statement. You might perhaps expect a king to come with more pomp and circumstance, riding some mighty stallion, perhaps, maybe at the head of a mighty army. But Jesus comes gentle, riding the donkey. And surely knowing the words of the prophecy of Zechariah, a prophecy concerning the Christ, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And behind that as well, there was another promise, a promise of blessing that Jesus knew from Genesis 49 when Jacob was pronouncing God's blessing on his sons and prophesied for the scepter of Judah that he would tether the colt of a donkey to his kingly branch. These are prophecies, I think, that explain why Jesus sent his disciples to get this purebred donkey, specifically a colt that had never been ridden, because that was part of these ancient prophecies. This is the way the, that the king would come. And so this is, as we might think of it, an essential prop to the drama of redemption that now is to unfold. And as Jesus rode down the Mount of Olives, the people of Jerusalem immediately recognized this royal symbol for what it was. It's clear from their shouts of acclamation, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 38, they knew that here is a king coming riding into Jerusalem, much, as, much the way that Solomon before him, another son of David, had ridden a donkey into Jerusalem. What they perhaps did not understand was what kind of king he had come to be, although maybe the donkey would give them a clue. This was not a political statement, as most of them perhaps thought, but a spiritual statement. And in a sense, Jesus wants to come riding into our lives the same way, with all gentleness and humility, not crushing us with superior might, but saying to us, even this morning, with all of the burdens and cares that we bear, come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and I will give you rest for your souls. Surely in a room with this many people in it, in the heart of a great city, there are those of us who have come this morning with various burdens and cares. And the Lord Jesus invites us to unburden ourselves by casting those cares upon him. I think also in this example of Jesus, um, something that should show us the style of our own engagement with the world and the way that we serve others. If Jesus is a gentle king, and everyone who loves him should serve him with similar humility. One scholar comments on this passage that Jesus could just as well have ridden in Jerusalem on his high horse. But the donkey, and now I quote, stands out as a deliberate rejection of this symbol of arrogant trust in human might and expresses subservience to the sovereignty of God. Jerusalem's king is humble yet victorious. And so the church does not effectively spread the gospel by sword or by arrogance, but by mirroring the humble spirit of its king and savior. We might put it like this, right? Rather than riding in to set everyone straight, we are more like Jesus when we come to people with his gentleness and peace. Well, after displaying, after claiming his property and displaying his humility, here is the third thing that the king does in this passage. He receives his glory, or at least some of it. And I think this is where Luke's emphasis falls on the royal reception that Jesus is given as he rides toward Jerusalem. I think it's important to notice here that the first people to give him this glory are his closest disciples. Here is a detail I think sometimes overlooked, but really setting the stage for everything that follows. 
We see in verse 35 that after they untied the donkey, they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. I think this is really the first acknowledgement in this passage that Jesus is the king. A king does not ride bareback. And so if Jesus is the king, the dignity of his royal person demands special honor and the disciples are trying to give that. They in the absence of anything else to put on this donkey, they strip off their cloaks and they cover the donkey's back. And then in a, I think, a touching display of intimate affection and private homage, they lift Jesus up and set him on the donkey. It's a kind of exaltation, that, uh, almost like athletes lifting up their coach on their shoulders after winning the championship. They, they lift Jesus up. They set him in the place of a king, setting him on the back of his royal mount. So the disciples in this story are the first ones to give the king his glory. But soon others start to follow his example. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. I think it illustrates what happens when we lift Jesus up and elevate him and worship him as our king. Others also join us to acknowledge his royal majesty. In this case, they give their honor by throwing off their outer garments and also palm branches, an ancient symbol of victory. Interestingly, Luke doesn't mention that, but that detail is clearly present in the other Gospels. And they, but here they lay down their clothes on the road in front of him. And again, an ancient way to welcome a king, a way of saying that Jesus is too worthy to ride on any ordinary road, but deserves a royal carpet to be rolled out before him. In effect, is in throwing down their cloaks, they are saying, King Jesus, you are so much greater than we are, so much more worthy of honor that when your donkey walks all over my clothes, it is not an insult to me, but it is my privilege. Then suddenly and spontaneously, the crowds began to swell. First, one person cast off his or her coat, and then another person, and another one after that. And the closer Jesus came to Jerusalem, the more people joined this parade. A whole multitude of his disciples, Luke tells us, verse 37, a great crowd of them began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the mighty works they had seen. It's important to know, I think, this was the beginning of the Passover feast. Pilgrims were streaming into the holy city as Jesus rode down the Mount of Olives toward the Kidron Valley and then up into Jerusalem. Great throngs of worshipers were already pressing towards the city gates. Expectations were running high. People had a sense of expectancy about this great religious festival. They were excited already. But when they heard from these shouts that the king was coming, the atmosphere became electric, the mood euphoric. Here was the culmination of everything the disciples had been hoping for, the proof that Jesus was the Christ. He had healed the sick. He had cured the blind. He had raised the dead. They had heard him preach repentance and forgiveness. They, they knew him to be the Messiah. This is, these are his disciples, the ones who believed in him. And now as he rode this royal mile into the holy city, they could see even more clearly that he was the king. And they were making way for his royal procession. Shouts of praise came to their lips. And they used ancient songs that were reserved for the coming of the king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. These words come from the Psalms of Ascent. The pilgrimage songs that worshipers coming to Jerusalem would sing on their journey to that great city. Except on this occasion, the disciples took ancient words and made what was implicit in those words explicit. They, they knew that Psalm 118 specifically was a promise of the Messiah and that the Messiah was royalty. And so rather than saying, blessed is he who comes, that's the language of the psalmist, they say, blessed is the king who comes. They're acknowledging Jesus as the Christ and as the King. And then, in a way, they elevate that ancient phrase of praise, and they say, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
Because you read the Gospel of Luke, you hear an echo of a very famous saying from the beginning of that Gospel when the angels of heaven, at the time of the birth of this Savior, said, Glory to God in the highest. Here is the King, and people want to give Him the highest praise. I wonder what you would have done if you had been there that day. Would you have thrown down your clothes to worship the King? Would you have shouted this praise? You know, we can do that this morning. Jesus is just as worthy now to receive this kind of praise from our lips. But I should note, it is strange to say that there were some people there that day who refused to join the celebration. Those grumpy old Pharisees. Here they are again, the party poopers of the Gospels. Not believing that Jesus is the Christ or that he deserves this kind of worship. In fact, the more they saw the popularity of Jesus, the more it aroused their hostility. And here they try to rain on his Palm Sunday parade by silencing his praise. The king will have his worship. And when the Pharisees demanded that he turn down the volume, Jesus answered by saying, I tell you, if these people are silent, the very stones will cry out. You see, Jesus was riding down the Mount of Olives. And if necessary, the stones on that mountainside would join his choir. The very rocks were ready at any moment by the command of God to break their stony silence and proclaim with joy that Jesus is the Christ. If that is the praise that he deserves, will you give King Jesus the honor that he deserves from you? I was amazing as it must have been to see that triumphant ride in Jer Jerusalem. Jesus has even more glory now. After he was crucified for our sins, he was raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God to that royal throne. And he may not be on parade at this moment, but even now he is receiving the honor he deserves from people all over the world, men and women and children, saved by his grace worshiping him today, and we have as much opportunity to praise him as anyone does. Acknowledge his sovereign kingship by throwing your life down before him, asking him to rule over everything you say and think and do. And do this knowing that one day Jesus will ride again in triumph. On the last of all days, he will come with his angels to gather his people into his royal train, what joy it will be to see the king on that parade. As I reflect on my own experience as a worshiper, I think that the hymns, the songs of praise in which I catch a glimpse of Jesus receiving this kind of royal glory are the ones that give me the most chills in worship. Let me share some of those favorite Hymns, hymns of exaltation in which Jesus is on parade and for a moment the veil of heaven is parted and I can catch just a glimpse of his regal glory. I wonder if you know some of these hymns. Do you know the hymn At the Name of Jesus by Caroline Noel? Here are her words. Brothers, this Lord Jesus shall return again with his Father's glory, with his angel train. For all wreaths of empire meet upon his brow, and our hearts confess him, king of glory now. But think of these words from the, tri the triumphant words of William Walson Howe's famous hymn, For all the saints, but lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day. The saints triumphant rise in brighter red. The king of glory passes on his way. Alleluia, alleluia. These words from Thomas Kelly. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the fight, return victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him. Crowns become the victor's brow. Hark those bursts of acclamation. Hark those loud triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy that sight affords. Crown him. Crown him, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, as glorious as it must have been to see Jesus on that first Palm Sunday, what higher, greater, 
glory and praise will he receive when he takes eternally that kingly throne. Everyone who trusts in this king and worships him as Savior and God will be part of that worshiping throng. Let me just pray for us before I invite us to ask questions or make further comments. Lord Jesus Christ, we want to add this morning our own hallelujahs and hosannas of praise and worship you as the glorious King and offer our lives for your royal service. This is our prayer, which we ask the Holy Spirit to answer as we pray to you, our Father God, in the name of Christ. Amen. We have a few moments for uh, people to ask questions about these verses or to make comments. Uh, who has a question to ask or a comment to share this morning? Be shy. Yes, you, sir. The Lord uh, tells us in this verse that, that the rocks could possibly cry out to worship him if his, if his followers did. From a scriptural standpoint, is praise always from, uh, is this exaltation, or can praise be things as giving an offering, uh, a financial offering? In other words, uh, I've heard but I'd like to know from Scripture, what does the Scripture have to say about what praise actually is? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if I can give a scholarly answer to that. I mean, just to, I thought you were going a slightly different direction with that question, so let me just make this comment. This idea that creation itself has praise to offer God, that, that's imagery that we hear, you know, the fields of the... Fields will clap their hands, and you have the, st the morning stars singing together. So this this idea that creation itself offers praise and worship to God, and um, possibly it's the case. I mean, the, the the language of worship is used quite generally in Scripture uh, to refer to singing, to re to refer to words of praise that are offered, but also uh, worship vocabulary is attached to things like bringing offerings. Um, so I think in, in a broad sense, um, all of these things are, are part of praise. Whether there may be more, some more limited vocabulary of praise that's more focused, um, I'm not sure. My sense is more the other way, that, that, that it's broad and encompassing. There are lots of ways for us to offer worship, praise, honor, um, a wide range of vocabulary that the scripture uses for that. Yes? Uh, just a question in like historical context, maybe. That imagery of like when Jesus is coming on the donkey and just as you said the crowds are gathering because they're coming to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And in that context, um, wondering how much of it was just a, a hoopla of the crowd coming and I mean how many of them could have really even known who Jesus was if they were coming from regions outside of Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, but was that a you know sort of a catalyst a moment um, in terms of the story of Christ and those people seeing him and then hearing more from the disciples and others. Just kind of interested about that. Yeah, kind of yeah. I mean, a couple of reflections on that. I mean, first of all, don't underestimate how famous Jesus was in Israel. And, you know, I mean, he had this teaching ministry up in the north in, the, in Galilee, and thousands of people had uh, come to hear him teach. And um, so I wouldn't underestimate, um, and, and he had been in Jerusalem on multiple occasions for various festivals. His ministry was quite well known, and so, um, you know, I'm sure there were people in the crowd, particularly given the wide range from which people came to Jerusalem for these occasions, perhaps people had not heard of him, or heard, but a lot of people had heard of him and had some kind of, they, they heard other people speculate about his messianic identity, even if that, they had not accepted that themselves. I would also say that the way that they're taking this scripture and applying it to Jesus, it, it's a sort of, there's a thoughtfulness and a recognition that's there. I will also say, though, that I think you see as the week unfolds that a lot of that was a shallow recognition because of all the people that, um, you know, turned away from Jesus or then were calling for his crucifixion by the end of the week. So there, there's a sort of crowd mentality that's definitely at work in Jerusalem. Um, and, and so I think hoopla, you know, there is, there is something to that. People are caught up in it. 
maybe without the deeper recognition. Um, and um, so maybe both and there. Yes? It's a comment. I've been involved in planning worship for a long time. And I'm always kind of challenged between the Palm Sunday celebration and the Easter celebration. And knowing with the Palm Sunday celebration that then we're entering the Holy Week and suffering and that the crowd turns on him. So I really appreciate what you said at the end, um, distinguishing between the earthly parade and the heavenly parade, because that helps me in thinking of Palm Sunday and Easter and the difference in just how we worship. That Palm Sunday was an earthly parade where we, you know, they really didn't understand, but Easter burst it all. So yeah. Thank you. yeah, thank you. And you know, there's a sense in which. Um, there's a, a suitability to celebrating the church calendar that helps us walk through these events in a way that uh, builds them into the rhythm of life. There's also a sense in which, for the believer in Christ, every day is Christmas because we have an opportunity to celebrate the incarnation of Christ. Every day is Good Friday because we're, it's an opportunity for us to take our sins to the cross. Every day is Easter Sunday because we, we serve a, a risen Christ. There's a sense in which... Um, we, we kind of hold that tension of all of these things being true, and it's always true that Jesus is the King. Yes? Does it mention Easter in the King James? Did I miss that? Yeah, the term Easter, that vocabulary, is not a scriptural term. Where did it come from? Well, Easter, uh, originally, it's, it's actually uh, a variation of the name of a goddess, um, and so there's a, um, there's a sort of pagan connection there. Um, so, you know, if, if um, it, it's become such a co common parlance, it's kind of like Christmas. People don't even remember what the etymology is of it. Um, so, Easter, that's a kind of broad reference to Resurrection Sunday. Or, maybe you don't like the term Sunday either, because that also is from, you know, pagan vocabulary, and you call it the Lord's Day. But Easter's not a biblical term. Uh, you know, I think it just became such a common parlance. It's just in the vernacular. It's so common. Yeah. Ken, we're nearly at the time. Maybe, no, no, we are at the time. It's 8.15. These people have important things to do today. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you all for uh, coming. Um, the person who I had designated to do our closing prayer was not able to make it today, so if you will indulge me, I'll just close this in a short prayer. Um, Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather together and study your word. We ask your blessing on each person here. Be with us through the day and through this week as we think about you and think about the work of your son during this week of life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.